What's up, everybody? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, on a Widow Wednesday alongside the Rogue One at Gary Widow. Good morning, Gary. Greg. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you? I'm good. Do you think it's weird that I had a hot dog for breakfast? <laughs> you know, in the bun, oh. hot ketchup, mustard, everything? Yeah, like it's, no, no, not ketchup and mustard. I do my own thing, but it's like... Uh, uh, well, hold um, on a second. Hold okay, on. Okay, 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 David David Copperfield. Let me behind the curtain. What's your own thing? What is a hot dog? Well, like? my favorite if you've ever if you ever had like a real New York style hot dog, <laughs> they have this kind of like a, they have this like onion relish that they put on it. It's basically like kind of like onion and like 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 diced onion and a ketchup y sauce that they put okay. on it. Sure. When uh -huh. you know you know those really long New York style hot dogs you get that yeah, have like, like snap when you bite dog. into yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Like a proper New York hot New York style hot dog cart will give you that kind of onion relish. And I just make my own kind of shitty version of that. I like dice okay. up onions and, and mix it up with ketchup and a little hot sauce and I make my own little relish. But yeah, I had a hot dog for breakfast and I thought, isn't that weird? But then I thought, well, not really. Like, I mean, if you had a, if I told you I had sausages and toast for breakfast, you wouldn't Great point. complain. And it's, isn't you that put, that's the same basic stuff, just in a slightly different configuration? People put ketchup right? on their eggs, right? So what's the problem with putting yeah, ketchup on some onions? I mean, I wouldn't do that, that, but you know. Here's, here's, I think, one of the wrinkles too. How long have you been up? What time did you get up? Um, I mean, I was up early. This the, ba the baby got us up early. Exactly. I was up. I was up around six ish. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was, yeah. I was, I was, I was awake at around six, but I wasn't like pottering around the kitchen until sure. like seven ish. It's one of those. Now, on top of being a new parent, on top of there being a global pandemic, you're a man about town. Like, do you know what I mean? You, do I think really, it's I'm a man about the house? I don't think I've had a hot dog for breakfast recently. I Let definitely tell you have. Something. I'm going to grow. I'm going to the grocery store later. Sure. And I'm and, I, and I'm and I'm excited about it. Like I'm going to the fucking black and white ball or something. Wow. Because okay. just going getting out of the house just to get some groceries is is an exciting journey for me these days. Are you going solo? Yeah, uh, Leah oh, would come with me, but then we would have to. We can't take the baby. So, That's, dude, that I mean, that was the thing. The the excursions when I would finally be like, all right, cool. I'm gonna. I have to go do a mission by myself, and just that driving a car and listening to music again, doing you know what I mean, whatever. Not having to worry about Benjamin or make sure you know Jen's taken care of or like you know strap him in, like all the things that come with having a newborn and moving them around during paternity leave. When I got to break off and go do something. Yeah, like even if it was, and it, it was always a chore. I was never like you know, yeah. going off and playing street hockey, Kevin. I'm always yeah. going to the container store. I'm always doing something. Yeah, just having that moment. I, like, with with our first, sometimes I would just go sit in the car. Sure, Could just just to be able to shut a door and be in a little fortress of solitude, even just for five minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. We haven't gotten to that yet, though. We haven't gotten to that oh, level get, yet. You'll, you'll, you'll get there. No, no, no. You, you, you haven't on this baby. You said that oh, was your I see first. What you mean. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a treat. You seem to be doing all right though. Yeah. Yeah. We're hanging in there. You're doing we're good. You're hanging in there. Good dad. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying everybody. I'm also trying to give you some news. Let's talk about the fact that more PlayStation acquisitions are coming. Wordle's going to the New York times and video game developers hate NFTs. We'll talk about all of this and more because this is kind of funny games daily each and every weekday on a variety of platforms. We run you through the nerdy video game news you need to know about. If you like that, be part of the show. Patreon.com slash kind of funny games over on patreon.com slash kind of funny games. You can write in to be part of the show. You can get the show ad free. You can get it with the exclusive post show. We do each and every weekday. Of course, you get a bevy of other, benefits for things like PSL love you xoxo you could be watching it live when we record it games cast when there isn't an embargo like today because tomorrow's dying light 2 review and oh so much more however if you have no bucks to toss our way it's no big deal you of course can get the show for free on youtube.com slash kind of funny games roosterteeth.com and podcast services around the globe each and every weekday it has ads it doesn't have the post show you can't write in because you're watching a vod but you still have a good time if you wanted to have even more fun, no big deal, twitch.tv slash kind of funny games, where you can watch us record the show live, just like Kebabs on TV is, Turbulent Turtle is, and OMGLXR. Remember, if you're watching live, you have a special job. Kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. Tell us what we screw up as we screw it up so we can set the record straight. If that still wasn't enough, you can support us on the Epic Game Store with the creator code kind of funny. Uh, you go there, anything you buy in the Epic Game Store, we get a kickback from. You might say, I don't use PC, Greg. I only use my Switch. I only use my PlayStation. I only use my xbox i respect that you of course can use your epic creator code kind of funny uh when you're using uh, rocket league uh fortnite uh the other thing too fall guys that's the one right they, they, they're, they're on epic's got everybody kind of and if they don't have them xbox has them if xbox doesn't have them bracer group doesn't have them if they don't you know the list goes on uh housekeeping for you 
There is a brand new episode of PSI Love You XOXO live right now, ladies and gentlemen. YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games podcast services around the globe. Uh, we are talking all about how Bungie is going to revolutionize PlayStation, of course, after PlayStation bought Bungie. Weird. I feel like it's the inverse, but that's how Jim Ryan's talking. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about more acquisitions. For now, though, thank you to our Patreon producers. Gort, uh, and by the way, February producers, a new round of names, Gary. This is always an exciting day. Mm, mm. Gordon McGuire. McGuire, maybe. Uh, James Davis, a.k.a. at James Davis Makes. Pranksky. Manny, the bagel boy Sanchez, and Blackjack. Today we're brought to you by DoorDash, but I'll tell you about that later for now. Let's begin the show with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. Oh, Baker's Dozen. I've never done this before, Gary and Kevin. I'll let you know, right? I was running late today. The day got thrown off, right? And then I had to take a shower real quick. Then I had to make the coffee, walk the dog. You know, I do the French press, right? So I put the water in the kettle to get it nice and warm or whatever, and then I just did not have enough time to make the show. So the, I'm brewing coffee with room temp, like not room temperature, a little bit hotter than room temperature coffee no, you can't or water. That. Impo- that's, you can't it's, and that. it's, it, you, I, exactly. It doesn't taste. I, I would have there. told you. What's going to happen? But, it, you know, it's, I just have a bad cup of coffee. Weird, isn't it? I, was reading, I was reading a thing about this recently about the science of temperature sure. and how mm. it factors into, like, whether or not it's a pleasurable tasting experience. And coffee's a, 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 the example that they were talking about. Like, hot coffee, we like. Uh-huh. Iced coffee, I, ice cold coffee, we Fantastic. like. Yeah. But tepid coffee, we don't like. Trash. See, I do. It's not the temperature really? that's throwing me off. It's the fact that the taste of it. I, when I get He's a cup a of coffee, the first don't thing as I do, and Kevin's seen it, I'll pop the top off, or if it's no. a cup, I just let it sit there because I don't want to burn my tongue. I have a well, no, you tongue. no, but you it's don't well want it known. super hot, but there is a sweet spot, right? And once it drops even a degree below that, I'm like, ah, oh, this isn't really what I'd call hot anymore. I, I, no, I can't have anything to do like with it. had like day old coffee just, that's been sitting If you want to know, like the one thing I, oh, well, I shouldn't say the one thing. I would say top of the list probably. Everybody can text or tweet Jen. Don't text her, I guess. T- tweet my, my wife, at Gangster, see where it ranks, but she is always horrified. Because I will get a cup of coffee at the farmer's market, whatever, where we're starting our day, put it in the, cu- the car, and then she'll see me <laughs> drinking that cup of coffee five hours later. She will be like, see, is that this is why I got that. This is, this is why I got that stupid ass Ember Bluetooth yeah. mug, because you can program it to, to keep the coffee at literally like my coffee is like 136 degrees fahrenheit no whatever. And it I'm, already too I'm already hot too like, i'm already hot all the time you, yeah. here's the thing, I'm, a, I'm a very slow coffee drinker right i sip it kind of throughout the morning which means the last third of the cup really goes to waste because by the time i've got that low it's 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 too cold for me to enjoy drinking it so it just goes to waste and heating up coffee in the microbes never great but the weird thing about the ember mug is when you even if it takes me two hours to drink it, the last sip of coffee is as hot as the first one. And it's actually like a really weird experience. Oh, wow, this coffee is like still hot. I like it a lot. I'm not being paid by Ember Mug to say this or anything. It's actually like just a really are. good mug. Like well, I, it's way too expensive for what it is, but it's really it? good. It's, 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 I don't know. Go look it up. Go to ember.com. It's a lot. It's, it's too much money. God, look at you. Just, and, then, and then one morning I wanted my coffee and it went, oh, you can't have your coffee because we have to install a firmware update. And I'm like, fuck this. There you go. That's the future yeah. you want to live in. Uh, yeah. Real quick, OMG underscore like really in the chat went, I drink 15 cups a day. And that cracked me up. <laughs> Number one on the Roper Report, there are more PlayStation acquisitions coming. We go to Christopher Drink at gamesindustry.biz. Kind of. We actually start on Christopher's Twitter where he put up this thread, which ends with something interesting, but leads into his article that he put up yesterday after all the news broke where he interviewed uh, Jim Ryan and Bungie's uh, Pete Parsons. Anyways, the tweets go like this. The motivation behind Sony's acquisition of Bungie is to help boost their own abilities to make live service multi-platform games. Equally, Sony unlocks the potential to Bungie to strengthen its technical capabilities and the prospect of taking its games to movie slash TV. The deal was in the work for the past five to six months. It's not a reaction to take two slash Zynga or Microsoft slash Activision deals. Here's the thing I think is the most interesting. And Jim Ryan told me, of course, Christopher Dring, we ex- we should expect more when it comes to further acquisitions. Again, Jim Ryan told me we should expect more, and that's in quotes, when it comes to further PlayStation acquisitions. If that wasn't enough, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, the Summer Games Fest man, Jeff Keeley, put on Twitter, have heard from multiple people. As you might suspect, there are a few other big video game deals in final stages of negotiation. It's going to be an interesting year. So, Christopher Dring, Games Industry Up Biz, again, has a great interview up. Whole bunch of insight from Jim Ryan, uh, Pete Parsons uh, from Bungie. Jim Ryan, of course, from PlayStation. And I'm going to read from it right in a second, I think, uh, about why this deal happened. Obviously, yesterday, Blessing came up, looking fly. He had that cool uh, sweatsuit on. 
And he's like, I'm going to have an easy games daily. And then at 10 o'clock, they're like, hey, by the way, PlayStation just bought Bungie. All hell broke loose. There was a bunch of discussion about that. P.S. I love you, XOXO, which is available right now, of course, go, jumps off of Dring's article, talks about this, and really goes into a lot of detail that we won't go super into. Uh, but I will bring it up in a second. For now, though, I want to talk about the fact that more acquisitions are coming from PlayStation. Gary, how does that sit with you? The, the more and more of this talk of the consolidation of the games industry, where are you at with it? I mean, I feel like we could be at the beginning of a new arms race. That's yeah. what it feels like, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it seems like we it's one of those that's slowly been happening, but now it's getting, you know, more and more bigger. I mean, it's getting bigger and bigger headlines. I mean, just this this July alone, you know, I mean, between, you know, between, uh, sorry, January alone, between, you know, the obviously the massive Microsoft acquisition and the Bungie thing, Obviously, it's not as big as Activision Blizzard, but it's a big one. You know, one of the Still biggest big, developers, yeah. one of the biggest brands, and we know we know Bungie's got more in them. It's not they didn't just buy Destiny; they bought you know a team that's capable of of much more than that. Um, and as Jim Ryan pointed out, they bought all of the institutional knowledge right about live services games. And that is the big thing. Again, if I can, I'll jump in and drop some of the drink, the drink uh, interview stuff in here. Again, the games industry app is that is the whole point. Is that I think yesterday it was very much hung up on. Oh wow, Destiny as an IP, Destiny Two, the game, the new IP coming from Bungie, and then I, I used you, uh, I channeled you a bit in a, a PS. I love you, Gary, talking about the typical executive word salad. Yesterday's yeah, yeah, press yeah. releases came with a lot of we're excited for the innovations and da da da, and they're like, what are you even talking about, Jim Ryan? But then they actually drive in into in uh, drinks here, right? Of talking about the fact, of course, that yes, the first thing they will be unequivocally stay independent, which we knew they're a multi-platform studio and publisher. Uh, Bungie will operate autonomously within the Sony thing. We knew all of that, right? But here's where it gets more interesting, right? Pete and I have spent a lot of time talking, and we were struck by how similarly we see the world and just how complementary our two organizations are. We're like two pieces of jigsaw that can slot together. They, this being Bungie, this is Jim Ryan talking, they make massive immersive games that have no end, whereas PlayStation's strength, as you know, is in the single-player narrative-rich stories. Our studios make those games, and they are some of the best you'll find anywhere. I've been on the record about um, I've been on the record talking about increasing the size of the PlayStation community and expanding beyond our historic console heartland. This can take many forms, and definitely one of the main ones is the ability for the wonderful games that we've been making for over the past 25 years to be enjoyed in different places and played in different ways. We are starting to go multi-platform. You've seen that. We have an aggressive roadmap with live services, and the opportunity to work with and particularly learn from the brilliant and talented people at Bungie, that is going to considerably accelerate the journey we find ourselves on. Those two paragraphs, again, great interview, great stuff by Christopher in Games Industry App is to really double down or expand on what we already knew, right? But really give a new lens to what this purchase was about. That this purchase is about bolstering uh, what PlayStation is doing online and how they're going to learn from that, let alone giving B Bungie, as it goes on to talk about, you know, Bungie wants to, uh, you know, make Destiny a, a TV property, a movie property, multimedia, and Sony's great for that too. So again, yesterday there was this conversation of, okay, it's interesting that they're buying Bungie for this much money. Is there, and I saw a lot of people going, is Destiny really going to make that much revenue? It would really seem like that's not even what this is about. This is about investing, you know, more than three billion dollars into a company, so you don't have to build your own. You don't have to go hire new people, get it spun up a division that's going to be all about online, make all the mistakes everybody else has made before. And said, you buy Bungie. What have you learned? How do you do multi-platform play so well? How do you do these online games so well, Gary? Yeah, I think I actually think it's a good point that Jim Ryan made when you think about it. That Sony's strength, particularly with first-party titles, has been with the kind of games that I really enjoy. Right, single-player, narrative, rich, big, you know, story, cinematic type experiences. Whether that be The Last of Us or uh, Spider-Man, Horizon, or Ratchet and Clank, Horizon Zero Dawn, Returnal, God of War, Uncharted. I mean, that's a really impressive portfolio of like some of the best narrative games in the business sony really does i think own that space way more so than microsoft does yep. um where they're weaker and where microsoft is arguably stronger and where they certainly got stronger after buying blizzard one of the biggest live service game companies out there with a, they have a ton of institutional knowledge too um that this does you know this i think you know adds another string to their bow in a really interesting way right and story the, the story narrative games aren't going anywhere we're always going to be interested in whatever the next god of war or uncharted is from those teams um but you know destiny and, you know, a whole bunch of other games have shown, you know, especially during the pandemic when everyone was flocking to playing online together, that, you know, we want those experiences too. Like, we really want those experiences. And that's mm -hmm. not, Sony is not, I think you'd agree, Greg, Sony's not excelled 
in there. That's not been their strong suit. 100%. But maybe now it can be because if, if I were Jim Ryan or if I were anyone with deep pockets going, we want to get into the live service game business. We have a ton of money. Who can we just buy that gets us to the finish line like immediately with all of yep. their skills and knowledge? Bungie. And that's where I want to bring in Nick's question. Nick wrote in, not Nick Scarpino, of course. Nick has no idea any of this is happening. He's probably booking some, I'm in a coal mine doing a comedy show. Nick wrote into patreon.com slash kind of funny games and says, hi. <laughs> hi so the Nick. idea of Nick doing a comedy show in a coal mine is just too funny. Kevin, what is up with Nick? I understand the pandemic hit comedy hard, but he's just doing them in the Minecraft, weirdest places. Yeah. You know what I mean? What is he up to? Top it, you of the know, Statue he's, of Liberty. He's trying to stay young. He's trying to stay young. It's important. It's not working. He's not uh, the David IGG. Blaine of comedy. He's always like some weird, <laughs> some weird fucking place. I had a thought question about all the acquisitions going on. I am platform agnostic and own an Xbox Series X playstation 5 and switch well sorry money banks uh, despite this i find myself still becoming more excited when news is announced of xbox buying someone this is for one simple reason game pass i immediately think about how the games owned and i'm sorry owned by the acquired publisher slash studio will now be available within game pass my question is what direct benefit does sony purchasing bungie have on the consumer thanks for all you do nick P.S. Gary, I'm loving Loodle and I'm learning a lot of new terms from it. Thanks for releasing. Such oh yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people had to Google today's word because they didn't know that it, 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 they didn't know how to lewd definition. Well, they they fucking know now. This is gross. Um, I think Nick, your and I know your question was written before that we started having this conversation. We're answering it with the fact that you're getting institutional knowledge from Bungie in the same way when Kojima Productions was like, we want to make Death Stranding, and they started working with uh, the Decima engine, Gorilla's engine, and got to learn from them. In the same way, you see other studios. Uh, yesterday, PS, I love you. We were uh, Janet brought up the reference of uh, for Naughty Dog's horse tech in Last of Us, right? They worked with uh, Ghost of Tsushima, or maybe no, that's right. Yeah, Ghost of Tsushima's uh, horse people. That's right? another one, another great Sony narrative. Yeah. And that's what defines Sony, right? But what has been slowly shifting, and if you haven't been putting it all together, you wouldn't know, is that, of course, Sony wants to try online stuff. I go to twitter.com slash Blessing Jr., where Forbes 30 under 30, a.k.a. the future class of video games, a.k.a. the OK Beast, Blessing Eddie OEA Jr. tweeted this yesterday. We're about to record PS I Love You XOXO in a bit, but in regards to being aggress aggressive about live services, and then he has bullet points, Insomniac is hired for a multiplayer project. Same with Sucker Punch. Naughty Dog. PlayStation partners with x devs on a game that will probably be a multiplayer shooter. Firewalk <laughs> is making a AAA multiplayer IP for PlayStation. I want you to take all of those announcements and hiring post Nick and grab them and put them with this idea that Bungie knows how to do online infrastructure and can do it. What direct benefit does Sony purchasing Bungie have on the consumer? It means that all the projects I just talked about that are using multiplayer aren't going to do their own thing and have it be bad. How many times have we seen uh, something hit in the industry? Someone tries to copy it or emulate or learn from it, and it doesn't work out. Sure, plenty of times you, you can find new ideas, new groundbreaking stuff. But I would venture to guess and say that, obviously, the Bungie that's working on Destiny 2 right now, years and years and years and years and years after Destiny 1, learned a lot and made a lot of mistakes and fell down and crawled and got back up. And are, now they are running in terms of making an online game. When you bring in that kind of institutional uh, knowledge, technical uh, knowledge, and of course, what they're actually doing on the technical side in terms of making things work behind the scenes, you can apply that to these projects. You can learn from that. They can tell you what is good about what, uh, what is good uh, for an online multiplayer game, what is friction for an online multiplayer game, what pushes people away, what draws people in. And I'm not saying not everything will be destiny, but we're literally just talking about the menus and the ease of use and things like that, Gary. I've talked I've talked about this a lot before on the show, Greg, that live service games, I think, are they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. They're a very much an emergent genre. The reason why we've seen more failures than successes is it's a genre that developers are still figuring out, right? We're still feeling out the edges of it. Like they're trying experimenting a lot of things, what works, what doesn't. And we have seen a, a, a lot of very high profile failures. Anthem, uh Avengers um i wouldn't call the division a failure i think it's actually one of the better oh, examples i do it it's not it's but it's not it's it's not i love the division don't get me wrong but it, it, it it's not i don't think it blew up the way that the ubisoft i i i don't ever see a division three um but so if you well, look at like what you, division heartland you're getting though don't forget you no know, it, it, it's they're not they're not a band it, it, i don't think it's like it wasn't like a tier one you know blockbuster the way that sure. you know destiny has sure. been and, and and really what and this is my point what has been other than destiny all we've seen are these very expensive play mats anthem you know even a company like bioware with all of their knowledge all of their skills and all of the back end of ea could not pull it off um you know square enix and crystal dynamics i mean these are these are companies with a lot of knowledge about how to make games and the, the big big avengers 
uh, you know, fell, you know, and it's, you know, and they're struggling to get anyone to give a shit. So, sure. and it's gotten to the point where I've noticed recently that the kind of live service thing, it's almost started to feel like a, a dirty word. I remember when there was even like a hint that Assassin's Creed might be going in that direction with like the Assassin's Creed Unlimited or whatever. People were like, Infinity. oh no, Infinity. don't do yeah, Infinity. Sorry, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. People are all pissed off about it. But Bungie, who practically kind of sort of invented this genre, you know, the kind of the loot grind live service shooter with uh, the first Destiny, they've been doing it the longest. They, um, and have had the most success with it. Like nobody knows more about the do's and don'ts of making a live service game right now than Bungie. Um, and so it makes total sense for me if, if Sony are looking for a turnkey solution that's just going to get them into that game very quickly, just buying in all of that, all of that knowledge and all that experience to me makes a lot of sense. A hundred percent. And you just said, you know, uh, the ABCs basically of, you know, doing these kind of games, which I want to call out. And I know you, this is usually your shtick, Gary, but I'd like to go into the chat and bust some heads real quick. Because when <laughs> I was making my point, Druvenator got held up on this. He went dot, 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 the menus, Greg. Yes, motherfucker. I'm not saying they bought them just for the menus. I'm saying that there's a lot to learn about player retention and what players like and what they don't like and how you do this and how fat. Like I'm talking, and this is somebody who has a fucking degree in magazine journalism. The amount of times we talked about below the page, below the fold, and what's all, going on all of those. All IGN. of those. You think they aren't tracking your fucking eyes and how fast you scroll through a page? Absolutely. At IGN? All time of those yourself details, out. Get the fuck out of my face. All though. of those little details matter. UX matters. The non-sexy things that you don't think are going to be important. They're all important. And I, I, again, Bungie could you could probably Bungie could probably sit you down in a conference room with their UX team and talk to you nonstop for a week about good about what make what makes a good menu and what makes a bad menu, and you would learn a bunch of shit that you never even fucking knew was important. That's what Sony is buying. Exactly. So then the question becomes: Jim Ryan told me we should expect more. What do you expect next, Gary? From I'm not this, asking to name names if you don't have like it off the top of your head, but you, this is where we're still like going. the next acquisition. Yeah. What do you think? Not, not even again. What do you like right now? Here's what we know. PlayStation, of course, and PlayStation Studios known for the single player narrative adventure. That's what has defined them. And for two generations now, if not more, really with the breakouts of Uncharted and Last of Us uh, defined what they are and what their brand is. And we've seen the hit, those games hit and really refine what everything looks like at PlayStation. Now, of course, they go get Bungie to make sure they can have an online infrastructure th that works there. Do you th what do you think the next thing could possibly be? What do you th we should expect more? Do you see? I mean, whether first whether parties it's, are going to buy more it's, multiplayer whether studios? It's Microsoft or Sony, I guess I don't really care that much because I I guess I would prefer Xbox because I have Game Pass, but I'll I'll have whatever the Sony version of that is as well when it comes out. Spartacus. I'm sure. For me, the the bit the low hanging fruit, and I suppose that it makes more sense for Sony because we just talked about story rich single player. And we've been talking about this on for ages. We used to talk about this on the X cuts. For me, the biggest low hanging fruit is Konami. Yes. Somebody the, 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 buy Konami. Somebody Those games please that, buy Konami. Konami doesn't want to make games anymore. So for fuck's sake, let someone else do it. Konami likes money. Keep go, you know, go make your pachinko and, and your fruit machines, your, your, your one armed bandits, and put them in Las Vegas, your Silent Hill slot machine. You can do that all you want. But like people still want the next big Castlevania game, people still want the next, you know, Silent Hill. Um, people Metal still want like next Can Contra you imagine, or whatever. Gary, they have announced they've bought Konami. They are now they have taken over Konami. And the first fucking thing they do is they give it back to Kojima. They're like, we're gonna hire you for Metal Gear. I mean Six. that. Let's I mean that would go. be a, yeah, that would be yet another seismic event, wouldn't it? It would be huge. That Microsoft be and insane. Sony are both. I think. In a, I, I don't think you're even talking about that much money. I think Konami would take a pretty reasonable offer, and it doesn't even have to be like we'll buy you know we're going to buy the entire company just like yeah keep being konami making pachinko machines or whatever it is you've decided is a more profitable you know line of business for you these days but like exclusively license the video game rights to all your titles to us for 10 years and we'll go make a bunch of new castlevania contra metal gear solid games silent 100%. hill come on like, you nail it of like how they should do this how they could do it how would it like yeah like all right fine you st st hold the license let's uh, let us license the ip from you let us yeah. do these things the way we want to do them do them right just like for example like lucasfilm licensed the you know the video game rights to star wars to ea for 10 years konami's not doing anything with those video those the, the, uh, the video game iterations of those properties they're just sitting there make take some money let let sony pay you a you know a billion Please, dollars or whatever. get us konami let us have konami Please, Reese Wild said, or yeah, Reese Wild says, uh, from software would be a good pick for Sony as well. That's true. That is true. From software would be a good pick. Yeah, I mean, there's, and I, I think you're right that we're not, 
I mean, again, we've already had this amazing January. The, the year's only just begun, and our heads are still spinning from all of these like major, you know, news stories. There's going to be more to come. There's big deals, you know, in the work. You know, these deals take a long time. As you rightly said, this the, the Sony thing obviously wasn't a reaction to. You don't go, oh, Sony's Microsoft bought a big company. We need to go buy, go buy a big company. You go from that to like buying Bungie in a week. That's not how it works. That deal was in place for sure, obviously for a long time. And it's just kind of a coincidence that two me mega mega deals got announced. Uh, relatively uh, close to one another, um, but yeah, we haven't seen the last of this. There's a lot. There's a lot of companies still out there that are, you know, theoretically, you know, waiting and willing and able to get, you know, scooped up in a in a big money deal. And yeah, are we are we getting closer to the demolition man? You know, every restaurant is a Taco Bell future. Can't, maybe yeah, we talked about it the other day. This consolidation. We already see it in show business where you know Disney. And uh, Warner Brothers own pretty much everything out there, and there's you know a handful of other things out there, but really all the all the big all the big uh, IPs are consolidated under you know a couple of different roofs, and Sony and Microsoft are on track to you know get to a similar place. And Nintendo, of course, will always just continue to be Nintendo with their little you know solid gold treasure trove of of IP that no one will ever. <laughs> Do you, you guys know, keep else. fighting. We're having a great time over here. Yeah, we we're over here with you know you, 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 that's cute. You bought Bungie. We've got fucking Mario. You know. We, which, which will never be defeated, you know. Mario will always be the biggest, the biggest name in video games. Nothing will. Well, ever we'll be see bigger. what Chris Pratt has to say about that. Uh, Gary, I want to talk to you about <laughs> another huge acquisition, that being Wordle. But before then, let me tell mm. you about what you can acquire: Patreon.com/slash Kind of Funny Games. You go to Patreon.com/slash Kind of Funny Games, support the show by giving us a few bucks, and of course, you could write in then to be a part of the show. You could get the show ad free. You get it with the exclusive post show we do each and every episode. But guess what? You're not on Patreon. So here's a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by DoorDash. If you've been listening to any kind of funny podcast, you know that we absolutely love using DoorDash. It's so great. It's so simple to just be able to order whatever food we want and then have it delivered right to our house. Along with the restaurants you love, you can now get groceries and other essential items delivered with DoorDash. You can get some drinks, snacks, and other household items in under an hour. Uh, with over 300,000 partners, you can support your neighborhood go-tos. We always talk about Volcano Curry in San Francisco, of course. Uh, ordering is easy, and your items will be left outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop off whether it is the local favorites or the nationwide chains like things like popeyes cheesecake factory all of that for a limited time y'all can get 25 percent off and zero delivery fees on your first order of 15 dollars or more when you download the doordash app and enter code kinda funny that's 25 percent off up to a 10 dollar value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the doordash app in the app store and enter code kinda funny don't forget that's code kinda funny for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. Gary Wordle took the world by storm, and now it's been purchased by the New York Times. We're going to start with the update on Wordle from Josh Wardle, the man who made it. Since launching Wordle, I've been in awe of the response from everyone that has played. The game has gotten bigger than I ever imagined, which I suppose isn't that much of a feat given I made the game for an audience of one. It has been incredible to watch the game bring so much joy to so many, and I feel so grateful for the personal stories some of you have shared with me, from Wordle uniting distant family members to provoking friendly rivalries to supporting medical recoveries. On the flip side, I'd be lying if I said this hasn't been a little overwhelming. After all, I am just one person, and it is important to me that as Wordle grows, it continues to provide a great experience for everyone. Given this, I am incredibly pleased to announce that I've reached an agreement with the New York Times for them to take over running Wordle going forward. If you followed along with the story of Wordle, you'll know that the New York Times games uh, play a big part in its origins, and so this step feels very natural to me. I long admire the NYT's approach to their games and the respect with which they treat their players. Their values are aligned with mine on these matters, and I'm thrilled that they will be stewards of the game moving forward. When the game moves to the NYT site, it will be free to play for everyone, and I am working with them to make sure your, win streak, your wins and streaks will be preserved. Thank you all for playing and making Wordle an unforgettable experience, Josh. I follow this up with two paragraphs from Mark Tracy at the New York Times, who wrote about the New York Times buying it. The purchase, announced by the Times on Monday, reflects the growing importance of games like Crosswords and Spelling Bee in the company's quest to increase digital subscriptions to 10 million by 2025. Wordle was, a, Wordle was acquired from its creator, Josh Wardle, a software engineer in Brooklyn, for a price, quote, in the low seven figures, the Times said. The company said the game would initially remain free to new and existing players. Gary, you, of course, made a knockoff Wordle called Loodle. Putting your biases aside that now you want to be purchased by Pornhub. What I'm do you not think biased. 
I'm not biased at all. I'm very happy for Josh Wardle. I was actually glad to see yesterday that I, I feel like the majority of the sentiment in terms of the reaction seemed to be uh, aligned with mine, which is good for him. He deserves of it. Of course. Um, and there were, some, there, there, were, there were some people out there saying, oh, he didn't have to do this. He could have opened a tip jar or something and made a bit of money. Uh, he didn't need to sell out to the New York Times or whatever. I think all these people are hypocrites. Any, any of, of these people... Any of these people who go, oh, you know, you're a sellout. If they had been in the same position and they had cre they'd created something that suddenly a major, you know, company's come along and say, we'll give you like three to four million dollars for it. Come on, you're taking the money. Of course you are. Um, in a way, it's 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 really kind of the third of the of the three B. You know, it's, it's it, in a weird way. It, it's it's the same story, right? You know, Bungie, um, Activision, Blizzard, and now Wordle. You know, these uh, game you know, basically games and game companies getting bought up by big, big media outlets, right? The New York Times is a major, major, you know, global media outlet. And they, you know, the, the, the cynical interpretation is, yeah, they took something which was this charming little free-to-play web browser word game that, you know, wasn't bothering anyone and wasn't in any way obnoxious. And now it's been subsumed into a major media company. A lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people don't like, a lot of people don't like the New York Times because, you know, news and current affairs, everything's politicized these days. Everyone's got to take a side. Um, and I guess the, the, the most germane thing is that they've said it will initially, uh, be for free, but if you're familiar with the New York Times and subscribe to them as I do, you have the app, they have, they have a bunch of little word games that they put up every day. They're like five minute word games and, um, you have to pay for them. They're not, they're not free to, to, to access. And, uh, and, and Wordle is very much, I, I, I predict that I was for ages ago, so New York Times are going to buy this. Cause like, if you look at their other little daily word games, this is so, it's so much in that family of games that they already have. It makes so much sense to them. It has a ton of mind share. Everyone's talking about it or being, it presumably will bring a lot of traffic to them. Um, it's probably a very, very sensible, you know, from business, from, from the New York Times sense to add it to their games portfolio for Josh Wardle's point of view to like take something that, he never meant to be anything, and now suddenly, you know, he's a, a millionaire. Um, you know, is is fantastic. You know, I, I think it's good for everyone. the The downside is, yeah, if at some point two months from now they put it behind a paywall, that's just a that's one more charming little thing that we had for free, and now we don't. It reminds me a little bit of what John Krasinski did. Remember some good news that he did during the yeah. pandemic, <laughs> yeah. and it was this it was this charming little kind of you know shoestring and duct tape. Oh, you know, we're just out here trying to have fun. Uh, kind of thing, and it, it put a smile on. He was doing it around the same time I was doing animal talking, and, and I remember it put, putting a lot of smiles on people's faces. Um, and then the next thing you know, he goes and sells it for you know to CBS for a fortune, and they you know put it behind a paywall. So you know everything's everything's nice and 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 wonderful and kumbaya until the you know the inexorable forces of capitalism kick in and say no no no, it's always at the end of the day about money. That, that that's valid, and there's there's legitimacy to that, but. It, 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 at the end of the day, to me, it's a story of a, a, a cool guy who created something smart without any cynical intent at all and made a lot of people happy. And now he's getting rewarded, rightly so. I, I, I'm all for it. Good for Josh. I think that's, that's the difference between him and Krasinski, right? And with what you're talking about is that, yeah, this is a guy who made a fun word game for his wife that then got out to the public and we all fell in love with it and started playing with it. And now, yeah, he makes <laughs> low seven figures for it. Fuck yeah, yeah, go get them. In the other side of the coin, yeah, with the New York Times doing it, people being mad that it might go behind a paywall, might do whatever. Again, I'm not even trying to, I threw it out as a joke to begin with. Now throwing it out for real of like, journalism is fucking hard and not an uh, easy way to make a buck anymore. And so as all of these different places try to figure out how to survive and have to start putting things behind a paywall, I want to talk about Forbes and Paul Tassi in a little bit. Actually, I can just do it here because it's just a shadow. If you didn't know, let me go. I put it in for required reading at the very bottom. I will toss it out right now. Let me go all the way down and grab it, though. Uh, Paul Tassi tweeted this today. Of course, if you don't know, Paul Tassi writes over at Forbes, does a bunch of great reporting on live service games. So he talks a lot about Destiny, a lot about Avengers, and so on. But today he tweeted this. My news. You demanded it. I spend a year trying to get it done. My articles are now out of the Forbes paywall. Instantly. No waiting. Also on weekends. Please go back to clicking again. I know I've lost readers, and I'd love for you to come back. I appreciate everyone who has stuck around this whole time, reading what you can, employing dot, dot, dot workarounds, but I get it if you left. Just go back to reading as normal, and hopefully I can demonstrate this is the right call for my audience, heart, heart. It is hard to make a living as a journalist. I knew this when I went and got my journalism degree, and I knew it was hard to make a, be a games journalist, too, to make a living doing that. 
I was getting my degree in journalism and working at the papers just as they were really starting to wrestle with how do you survive in a dot-com era? And you were starting to see subscriptions and paywalls go up. And I know better than most that it's annoying when you're trying to gather video game news or you're just trying to peek in an article that your parents sent you or whatever. And it is, well, hold on, answer this Google survey before you do anything, or you can pay the money to get in if you really want to do it, blah, blah, blah. It's what has to be done to try to keep journalism alive. You can't, we can't lament the people getting, you know, layoffs at whatever the Washington Post or whatever newspaper you want to call out was their whole newsroom gets laid off or consolidated. You know, my former paper, the Columbia Daily Tribune got bought and they cut everybody but one reporter. And now it's just this thing that turns out a whole bunch of stuff that is not really local news. The Columbia Missourian is still doing a lot of great work. I digress. You need to support things like this. And so the New York Times buying it, I, I when it happened, I, I would tweet out, God damn it. Just more the fact of like, I can't believe it's happening. Many people read it as me being like, yeah, fuck the New York Times. Like, no, no, whoa, I, I subscribe to the New York Times. I pay for a New York Times subscription already. So going behind a paywall wouldn't hurt me here. And honestly, if I didn't, this would probably be enough that I would go, you know what? Why not? I'll kick them a few bucks and play the game. And then also you know, light bulb, you also get to read the newspaper. You get to read the news that the New York Times is doing and the journalism there is doing. That, of course, is what we're talking about, right? Where Kurjuki writes in and says, uh, this, and I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, sorry. Silly Pants Jackson in the live one said, if Wordle goes behind a paywall, it's dead. That is not correct. It's dead in terms of being the phenomenon it is. It will go behind there. But as with most of these kind of things, the New York Times is hoping this converts yeah, 1% of the I mean, do, do you know audience. how many people play the New York Times crossword every day and they have to pay to play it? A and lot. This is the thing. It's 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 looking to convert one percent of the world audience to come in buy a subscription, yeah, and then maybe stick around. You know, add value to the people who are only doing the crosswords. Add value to the people who are doing it to read the paper, right? And OMGesus says, remember, quote, remember when Wordle was free and everyone was talking about it on Twitter. Uh, remember when Wordle was free and everyone was talking about it on Twitter. End quote. And he puts he, he credits that to our future as a conversation we're gonna have a future. Yes, that is going to happen. That was going to happen if Wordle stayed free. I've already noticed that I stopped. Pay I'm not posting my Wordle results anymore. I'm still playing it usually every day, but I've done a couple days. Now I play every I, day. I, I missed one day the other day, and I lost my streak because I played it on the computer instead of on the phone. Ah, yeah, you streak. can't do that. Your streak, your streak keeps going when you come back. I was surprised by that. I thought when I, we missed our first day, I was like, oh, our streak's over. But it wasn't. It's just counting the ones you win or lose, which is great. Right, right, right. So like, this is the ebb and flow of it. And again, I know we sit here and we you know I, everything should be. It'd be great if everything was free. It'd be great. All this stuff happens. I'm with you, Gary. That this is a win-win because guess I, what could have happened. The New York Times could have just made a, a Wordle clone. They could have just fucking cloned it and been like, here's our version of it. And maybe it wouldn't have gotten bigger out of even headlines. I but don't. Josh I don't. W w w Waddle wouldn't have gotten Wardle. any money out of that. I don't understand this. The, and, we, and we got conditioned to everything on the internet being free. I get it. And a lot of terrific content on the internet is still free. It's ad supported or it's just put up there for free, whatever. But when someone like clicks on an article on a, on a thing and says it's behind a pay, oh, I've got to pay to read this, fuck off. I mean, do these people, when they go to the market and look at the boxes of cereal on the shelves, go, oh, wait, I've got to pay for this? Fuck you. It, you know, just like a box of cereal, a news article is something that took time and money and effort to produce and bring to you. It's a commodity and it's a business. And, you know, there are different ways to bring people content. You can, you can, you can have ads and then people put ad, fucking ad blockers on them. The Guardian's, the Guardian's a good example. I subscribe to The Guardian. The Guardian's actually completely free. Um, and the, the, but they have a voluntary news. It's like, if you would like to support us, here's an option for you to support us. And when you support them, you get like a couple of other little features, like the ability to like bookmark articles or whatever. But none of that stuff is actually behind a paywall. And they've actually been phenomenally successful doing that. They, they do very, very well off of that model. So there's still different. You know, paywall is not always the answer. But, you know, New York Times, let me think what I pay for. I pay for The Guardian. I pay for New York Times. I pay for The Washington Post, but that's rolled in with Amazon Prime. Um, and I pay for I really Apple. Plus. Yeah, if you, have an, if you have Amazon Prime, you have a subscription to The Washington Post. I look into that. Um, and I pay for Apple News Plus because there's a ton of content behind the Apple News Plus paywall which is really really good and i enjoy reading a lot of their stuff so um yeah i don't I, I, again just to bring it back to the uh to the to the to the word to the wordle of it all i am really glad there's always going to be the malcontent there'll be like oh, fuck wordle i'm never playing it again or whatever fuck the man fight the power whatever fine that's 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 a valid point of view but i was i was glad to see that most people because he went about it the right way because it's a very charming story because it seems like he's a nice guy the vast majority of people are like you know what good for him he deserves it why not when exactly. you, you know when when you create something like that lightning in a bottle which you're lucky to do maybe once in a lifetime and you get and you get a i don't know what josh, josh Wardle's financial situation was 
prior to this, maybe you already had a bunch of money. I don't know. But if someone offers you like three, four million dollars, that's life changing money that can set you up for life. And what's, you, your, what's you, the number you're putting on Ludo? What's the new the Ludo number? <laughs> Well, Greg, you know, I can't possibly prejudice negotiations that might okay, or may not yeah, be ongoing. Yeah, 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 bloody, it's happening already. I understand. <laughs> I understand. My apologies. My apologies. Uh, in the, you're wrong. I have some for later on. But like Jack Martin says, not sure if you cover this, but New York Times subscriptions are separate from New York Times game subscriptions. That's right. But, you actually, if you want to play all of the word games, you have to pay an extra subscription. But you can, so it's the crossword might, that's I think included. You might be able to buy, I think you might be able to get a subscription to just the games. I yeah, can't you, remember. That, yes, I, you can do just the paper. You can do just the games. But I remember there's all accesses, which is what I have. Which I think gives me at least the crossword. Maybe it just gives me the crossword. I don't know. I haven't looked into it enough. But well, you can, yeah, I think you can do the crossword for free every day. But then they have like four or five other little games in their little kind of five minute daily word gotcha. game section. Okay. Okay. And I think maybe you can play them for a limited time. But after a while, it'll ask you to, to sign up for a subscription. And my guess is that eventually Wordle is going to go behind that 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 wall of course My, i think they'll keep it free for a few months and then it'll go behind the wall let's move on to number three on the rope report team 17 has been publicly condemned by its former business partner for selling nfts this is george yang at GameSpot. indie developer agro crab games has put out a strong statement against nfts the studio condemned one of its business partners publisher team 17 after it had announced it would begin selling nfts agro crab has only worked with one on one game together with Team 17 so far, uh, and it was 2020's Going Under, which is a roguelike about being an intern. It's great. You should go play it. Uh, the statement reads, quote, We believe NFTs cannot be environmentally friendly or useful and really are just an overall fucking grift. Please do not harass employees at Team 17 or the devs under their umbrella, as this decision seems to have taken everyone off guard and likely came from the very top. Needless to say, we will not be working with them on further titles and encourage other indie developers to do the same unless this decision is reversed. I fuck Fucking hate it here. It says this is the official statement. Founder Nick Common uh, and creative director uh, Kalen uh, Pollock. This is Back the kind of word salad I can get behind, Greg. Spicy word salad. I fucking hate it here. I love it. This, this is, is what how we feel want. Every day you wake up a new NFT news. Right? The backlash from the online community was strong enough that the publisher has since deleted its tweet of the NFT announcement. NFTs have been a hot button topic uh, in the game space, with companies such as Ubisoft going all in on the venture. Uh, yeah, while audiences and developers remain skeptical about them. If that wasn't enough, then I have another follow up also from GameSpot, not George, who wrote the last one. This is Eddie uh, about the Overcooked devs. Ghost Town Games, the developer of the popular overcooked series has released a statement confirming it will never engage with nfts for the overcooked franchise or any future games quote we at ghost town games just wanted to reassure you all that overcook parentheses and, and overcook yeah, and any of our future games will never engage with nfts we don't support nfts we think they carry too great an environmental and social cost the studio said in a social media post we also want to ask folk to be kind when voicing their concerns to their friendly neighborhood community managers end quote there's never any reason to believe that Overcook would engage with NFTs, but it seems Ghost Town Games is getting ahead of the matter with this statement. The statement comes just one day after, uh, just one day after uh, prolific voice actor Troy Baker canceled plans for his own NFT-related project, while Team 17 generated discussion and debate over its Worms NFTs. Before that, Ubisoft launched a new NFT platform called Quartz, putting NFTs in Ghost Recon Breakpoint. The company later suggested that players don't understand why they would want them. Did you see that last week? It wasn't one of your shows. Well, last week when Ubisoft's like, you just don't get it. Oh, yeah. I thought you don't get you it. Don't, we you hate don't really this know shit. what you Stop. want. You're too stupid Stop. to understand why this is good for you. Yeah. That was good. I, I just appreciate the aggro crab games, of course. Going under a great game you should play. But, of course, just being like, it's a fucking grift. We, I fucking hate it here because, of course, you have to come out and say this kind of shit. You, you and then overcooked just unprovoked, being like, we got nothing to do with it either. All right. You we don't want anything to do with this. There's a there's an Irish comedian on Twitter that I follow who does these video comedy skits and he did a thing where someone brought their NFT to the Antiques Roadshow. It's fucking hilarious. You should you should I dig it up that. if I you can. Yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. really well done. Um, first of all, just on the Troy Baker of it all, I saw that yeah, you know, my 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 good friend and yours, uh, Troy Baker, uh, got to got to experience the thrill of being the main character of the internet the other day. Never good. Uh, I felt bad Never for good. him. Because, you know, you know, he's a good guy. And the, listen, to, the only NFT that I think of when I think of Troy Baker is National Fucking Treasure. Troy is a good guy. And the NFT thing, I, I, if he's walked it back, I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad that he's, um, that he's realized that maybe it wasn't the best idea. I don't know. But what I find he surprising... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get the tweet for you. I'll get the tweet for you. What I find surprising about the whole NFT business at this point is if you saw a bunch of people walking into a buzzsaw, 
and getting fucking <laughs> sliced and diced. Would you go, oh, that looks like a good idea. It'll be different for oh, me. Let's, let's try that. Maybe it'll go better for us. Or would you just walk in the other direction? And th But that's what's happening, right? Every single time somebody, the public mood out, and maybe it'll change down the road. Who knows? Maybe someone will make do NFTs the right way. If there even is a right way, I don't know. I'm not an expert. But maybe the public mood will change. But right now, right now, the number one way to get the internet to tell you to fuck off is to say we're getting into the NFT business, right? And we've yeah, seen right. it time and time. There's just no way. To, the time is not fucking right. Read the room. Read the fucking room. Yeah, Tam had and, a great but, rant on his last Games Daily, I think, on Friday, right, about read the room. Maybe it was Wednesday, about read the room of just like, when it was the Ubisoft guy, he's like, you just don't, they, they just don't get it. Like, shut the fuck up. Even if you this, think it's working, it's not working. Even if you've somehow figured out how to make NFTs not bad for the environment, shut the fuck up and wait till, you know, figure this out. Let everybody get this. With this, with this most recent one, the Team 17, the first I saw was somebody making a tweet going, holy shit, I woke up this morning and the first I even knew about this latest NFT story was the retraction. Like, it happened so fast. Yeah. Like, I saw, I, the, I the saw it go through. The time between... Whatever, like the fucking Overton window or whatever is between somebody announcing uh, an NFT and then walking it back. Like at this point, they should just prepare the NFT announcement and the retraction at the same time and have the retraction ready to go. <laughs> like just put them out, just put them out together as a thread. Like two tweets come out immediately. Hey, yeah, we're excited to, to announce we enter the NFT business. And then like two seconds later, based on public reaction, we've decided this was a mistake and we won't be doing it after all. Just like cut out the middleman and get it all done at once. The tweet got removed, apparently, as the reporting said for uh, Team 17, but I still have the press release for it. Team 17 to launch Meta Worms NFT. Team 17 has partnered with Reality Gaming Group to create high-quality, low-energy consuming Worms NFT collectibles, giving fans the chance to own a unique piece of video game memorabilia. The limited edition Meta Worms NFTs will encompass content from across the 26-year history of the beloved Worms franchise, which is sold for $75 million. Uh, the form of unique uh, generative artwork. Each Meta Worms NFT NFT will be secured and protected on the blockchain, providing documented ownership indefinitely. Each digital collectible item will be 100% owned by the person who bought it. Moreover, Worms digital collectibles are one of a kind and cannot be copied, which makes them scarce and potentially quite and potentially quite valuable. Let's let's get let's get a little bit speculative here, right? They're potentially quite valuable. You love Worms, why not invest a bunch in some Worms guys here that maybe could be the next Beanie Baby? The only blockchain I care about is all the people I fucking block whenever they start talking about NFTs. Swish. Gary just got him. Uh, Choice tweet uh, was posted yesterday and reads like this. Thank you all for your feedback and patience. After careful consideration, I've decided not to continue to part the partnership with Voice Verse NFT. Intentions aside, I've heard from I'm, I've heard you and apologize for accusing anyone of quote hating just by simply disagreeing with me. So good on Gary. Or I'm sorry. I'm, I'm let me uh, let me ask you this. Do you think that? Because it's hard to say, and I'm and I'm not an expert on NFT. I, here's the thing: I I try to kind of stay out of it because I'm not an expert on NFTs. I, I I've looked a little bit at like what basically what it is and the reasons why a lot of people seem to think it's a scam. But I'm not. And I, there are other people that they go, no, no, there's like the, there's there's legitimacy to it, and I I haven't gone into it enough to really know. But I just know that the overwhelming public sentiment is against it. Do you think that will ever change? Do you think that there is a possibility that somebody could do NFTs in a way that people go, oh, actually, that's kind of cool, and it does become accepted in some way? Or do you think it's just dead on arrival, like it's, it's done, like it lasted for like two minutes, but everyone's always going to hate it? I love this, and this should be its own podcast. I'm Not that I'm saying I'm going to stop the conversation. I would have said before, at the start of the year, I would have said probably like, Listen, everybody hates NFTs now and they're bad for the environment now. Eventually, someone's going to crack this. They're not going to go away, blah, 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 blah. The problem we have is that gamers are so dialed in in a way other people aren't. You know what I mean? Because that's what's ridiculous right now is that McDonald's has NFTs. The U.S. Postal Service has NFTs. Like, NFTs are taking off. They're everywhere right what now. What about Fucking this new one, Greg? You're going to love this. You see what Atari's doing? Just because oh, they, yeah. they haven't shitted on Atari's legacy quite enough yet. Um, for the 50th anniversary, Atari's rolled out something called GFTs, which, uh, which are based, the G I believe stands for gift. It, it's, it, here's what they've done here. They've, 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 they've combined fucking NFTs with loot boxes. Not only do you buy the NFT, you don't even know what the fuck you're getting until you open it. Well, I mean, does, like, it, does, does anyone give a fuck? You can't tell me anybody's looking at these apes and being like, this is fucking good looking. These are all like, I'm trying to like, get, I'm trying to get in the ground floor of a like stock. Right? It's like scientists in a lab going like, cancer's terrible, isn't it? But what if we could combine it with AIDS? 
<laughs> well, let's just let's just let's just let's just see what that give would be like. Give me time. I'm gonna figure out cancer. We're gonna make it good. That my the thing is that I think clouds the is that gamers are so in and like dialed in on what's happening and hate it so much that I really think we have a shot to stomp it out in games to keep it out of games for a while, if not forever. But it's the rest of the world. I saw nanobiologists go. I was like, Disney's got NFTs. Like they're everywhere in, in their sports. They're you know like well, see that's my, everywhere. And I don't think the rest of the world's paying attention. Like how well, much that's my, shit that's my other fear, Greg. Is that sometimes the market that you always say like the market decides right? Consumers ultimately decide what succeeds and fails, right? You either mm -hmm. people either go to a you know you can market a movie all you want, but people either go to um, a um, you know a movie or you don't, right? And and and, and people decide whether or not the movie is a box office success, but. Like you said, no one's like none of these companies are listening, right? Every company's pressing ahead with NFTs, and I wonder if it's a situation where, like, as much as we say we don't like them, it's going to get forced on us no matter what. And then and, and five years from now, like, yeah, NFTs are just part. We, we didn't want them, but like the four the four companies that control the world decided that we decided that we did want them, and so now we have them, and there's no way to fucking avoid them. It's the thing. No, okay. There was something I saw. Where was it today? I thought it was on the news. Somebody was talking about, maybe it was one of my updates. Hold on. Here it goes. Yeah, Bloomberg. My Bloomberg subscriber, uh, I subscribe to Bloomberg. Uh, Insider today dropped this piece of news on me today that maybe, stick with me and I'll get back to where we're going, right? Crypto regulation is coming. This is not the article. This is just the flyer about it. Regulators across the globe are getting more serious about crypto this year as concerns grow about environmental, the environmental impact of crypto mining and the use of digital assets for illicit activities. Governments are grappling with balancing the need for more oversight and investor protections with their desire to cash in on the burgeoning industry. Then it goes through in Russia, Vladimir Putin uh, has indicated uh, he supports a plan to tax and regulate crypto mining rather than ban rather than the ban uh, it was proposed uh, by the central bank key democratic lawmakers in the u.s which has become the largest bitcoin mining center following china's ban last year have been holding hearings and asking mining companies for details of their power usage and greenhouse gas emissions what i'm doing is calling this out again is that right now outside of the fact that people are saying buy this it could potentially be worth money and that seems like a fucking scam and you're selling me fucking bath water and telling me it's gold is the fact that the other th the problem is the environmental impact, right? And how much energy all this shit's consuming, how it's really fucking the place up even worse than we already have. With the government and regulation and starting to get involved there, there is that future that you can look down that may, and I, I've heard a lot about the the next wave of uh, how they're doing the blockchain stuff. And again, I, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination on any of this, that that next wave that they're all trying to get that not all of them, but the good ones or the people who are trying to do good or trying to get to will be less of an environmental tax on the entire fucking planet. Like, if they can cross that line before the rest of the world kind of understands and wraps their head around how bad it is because they're buying a fucking Fry Guy NFT, I don't know what McDonald's NFTs are. I'd buy no, I wouldn't buy. I'd buy a Fry Guy toy. Is that a, how is this, well, here's what I don't understand? How is this regulation gonna gonna go down with the people that are like really into crypto? Because like, isn't the whole point of crypto? They at least will one fucking of the points, vanish. Are you it's kidding? They're there. It's, it's like oh, it's completely out. unregulated. It's decentralized. It's this fucking anarcho currency. We're all running around like fucking Mr. Robot with our V for Vendetta ma masks fucking spending fake money to buy, you know, uh, black market drugs on the dark web and hire assassins to kill each other or whatever. Like that's the fucking utopia they're talking about. Um, <laughs> and if the, and if the government, if the government's going to get involved and start regulating it, I think a lot of these crypto bros are going to lose interest. They, no, it's not even lose interest. It will be a hot and cold thing. That is what's like, Spoiler alert, what's going to happen is that, yes, something like that will happen and all of those people will sell immediately and it'll be all the people who spent their life savings or whatever, not even maybe life savings, maybe I'm being, the people who put their money into it thinking it was going to pay off and suddenly it goes from being worth, I don't know how much NFTs are worth, a lot of money to no money. It will be Beanie Babies, where all of a sudden it's just the market. I just feel like every single day there's another story in the news, like $5 billion worth of crypto just fucking vanishes and nobody knows why. Like, does nobody think this is a fucking problem? <sighs> Gamers do, and so do game developers. So they're being vocal about it, and everybody keep on the case and stop and you know tell them what you want and what don't want. Number four in the Rupert Report: FTC is looking at the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition. This is Dave David McLaughlin over at Bloomberg. Uh, the U.S. Antitrust Review of Microsoft Corp's proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard Incorporated will be handled by the Federal Trade Commission, according to one person familiar with the matter, putting the deal in the hands of an agency that has vowed more aggressive. Uh, 
po uh, policing of deals. The FTC will oversee in the investigation into whether the takeover will harm competition instead of the Justice Department, said the person who wasn't authorized to speak publicly about the review. The two agents share responsibility of antitrust reviews of mergers and often reach agreements about which one will investigate on a deal. Uh, it goes on more and more about this, but the FTC and Microsoft didn't comment about it. So just a heads up that that's happening. Well, does that mean it won't happen? Probably not. Their article has this. Microsoft's last significant takeover, a $17 billion deal to buy transcript software maker Nuance Communications Incorporated, was approved last summer by the U.S. and European Union officials. The U.K.'s Competition and Markets Authority is still reviewing the transaction. So just a heads up. They're going into it. I doubt it'll happen, but that's what's going to go on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then number five and final on the Roper Report for today, you're getting more Dark Pictures anthologies. This is Ryan's D Ryan Dinsdale over at IGN. Supermassive Games seemingly has plans to release at least six more Dark Pictures anthology games on top of its upcoming The Devil in Me. The developer has trademarked six further titles in the franchise with the European Union Intellectual Pro Pro Property Office, as spotted by The Marmalade on Twitter. Uh, the six games trademarked all under the Dark Pictures anthology brand are called Switchback, Directive 8020, The Craven Man, Intercession, Winterfell, and Odeth. Super Massive Games has already released three games in the series, Man of Medan, Little Hope, House of Ashes, and confirmed a fourth is on its way. The upcoming The Devil in Me was announced to be this, by the studio in October and revealed to be the season one finale for the series. Ahead of the franchise's release, release of Man of Medan in 2019, Super Massive Games said the Dark Picture Anthology would span eight games with a release schedule of two per year. If all the trademarks are... Uh, games are released however that would bring the total up to 10 games two more than the developer initially planned there's no guarantee that supermassive games will develop all of the trademark titles into full games but it's likely some of them will be initially planned eight game schedule gary that's great news i'm excited about that yeah i'm liking the vibe of these dark pictures games i really enjoyed um what was that first in um uh, yeah, no no the one before that the thing that they did for sony the, oh the until dawn game. until dawn until dawn so i really liked until dawn and I haven't played a Dark Pictures game yet, but I, I really like the fact the, the fact that they're um, they're two players. Yeah. There's like no, well, there, they can be even more than that if you want something that Lee and I can play together. Um, they look beautiful. The graphics look great, and uh, I'm always down for a good horror experience. We've got House of Ashes installed on the Xbox right now. We just need to um, personally I, my I, favorite one, and I, I know that not everybody agrees with me on that, but I think they've gotten better as they've gone. I suspect nothing's going to get played on the TV for the next few weeks, other than uh, Forbidden West. But uh, when I can finally get that back uh from from leah i think we'll maybe we'll try some of the dark pictures stuff for sure for sure gary i'm excited to see what's going on with all these dark picture games but that's so far away if i wanted something more immediate say what came to the mom and grab shops where would i go the official list of upcoming software as listed by the kind of no wait hold on what wait you're nailing, Okay, start again. Uh, the official list of upcoming software on each and every platform as listed by the kind of funny games daily show hosts each and every weekday. Yeah. Yeah. Out today! Discord support is officially rolling out on PlayStation consoles this week. You can get it. I got it this morning. Uh, Dynabomb is on Xbox One. Life is Strange Remastered Collection is on PS5, PS4, Xbox Series X slash S, Xbox One, and PC. Storyteller is on Switch and PC. Uh, Charon's Crypt, even Death May Die, is on Switch. And then Gun Gun Gun, all one word, is on Switch. New dates for you. Oddballers is a new dodgeball multiplayer party game where just about anything you can find can be thrown at your opponents. Launching March 24th on PC via the Epic Game Store and Ubisoft Connect, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Stadia, and Amazon Luna, and of course PS5 and Xbox Series X slash S compatibility. Uh, the game can be played online or, so or multiplayer or solo for four players locally and six online. Deals of the day for you. I got an Xbox Game Pass update for you. Coming on February 3rd, you get these games. Contrast, Dreamscaper, and Telling Lies, a game I adore. Uh, then you get Feb February 10th, you get Besiege, Crossfire X, uh, Edge of Eternity, uh, Skull the Hero Slayer, The Last Kids on Earth, and The Staff of Doom. Then on February 14th, Valentine's Day, you get Ark Ultimate Survival Edition and Infernax. So enjoy those games if you got Xbox Game Pass. Um, Gary, we ask people watching live on twitch.tv slash kinda funny games to go to kinda funny.com slash you're wrong and tell us what we screw up as we screw it up so we can set the record straight for everybody watching later on youtube.com slash kinda funny games, roosterteeth.com, and podcast services around. Ding, ding, you should really world. just retire this segment. The nanobiologist says there's breaking news. There's going to be an un uncharted collab has been data mined in Fortnite. Kevin, this is for you. There's a new challenge. Collect the treasure using an uncharted treasure map. 
And then uh, I was just, okay. That's, there's going to be stuff for the I'm Uncharted so movie, in. Kevin. Okay. Uh, Kebabs gives me more context for developers hating NFTs. He says, the Twitter account for the Hat and Time devs also tweeted, NFTs stinky. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh my God, this show's done. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da. What's this not here? No, that's not news. Okay, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's another episode of Kind of Funny Games Daily. If you're watching live on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games, the good times don't start. Stop. You can keep watching right now and you'll get Mike, Andy, and Nick playing Spy Party. Uh, if you want to follow me and Gary, we're going to go to patreon.com slash kind of funny games, record a post show you can get later in the day, of course. Of course, on patreon.com slash kind of funny games, you can get the show ad free. You can write in to be part of it. You can be a Patreon producer. You can get the post shows and you can support all the other shows the exact same way. Uh, tomorrow, your host on Games Daily is going to be Blessing and Andy. Thursday, it's me and Tim. And then Friday, it's me and Mary to the games gabe patillo if that wasn't enough kind of funny for you remember patreon.com slash kind of funny games you get all sorts of stuff remember tomorrow youtube.com slash kind of funny games and the games cast podcast feed our review of dying light 2 goes up so it is a big time mm. review season here and it's fantastic gary you killed the day i'm proud of you that was a good show today i thought i agree until next time ladies and gentlemen it's been our pleasure to serve you